Hey there, just a quick video on uh, a new little tidbit with regards to oaths in the system. Uh, quite a while ago, there was this post here to back down in uh, 2010, June. Coat of arms signals a major change. Now, it was in 2000 that I first noticed this and did some research on it and found documents that uh, put in context the time frames that were related to the change in the coat of arms and that the coat of arms was changed from one that had uh, gold fringe flags uh, or silver fringe around the uh, French flag and a gold fringe around the British flag and the crown changed shape, the lion changed, these uh, creatures on the side were changed, uh, every element of it was changed. Now the political uh, public reason for it being changed was the addition of this circular ribbon here which has a Latin phrase on it. So that was the official reason as to why the coat of arms was updated. And I believe that that was just a ruse to allow the changing of the gold fringe flags and the other elements in it. Every element having symbology that meant something in law to those who, you know, know how to read these types of symbols. So uh, the official date of that particular change of the coat of arms was 1994. And that is an uh, act that was signed by the Queen in uh, 1994. But many of the departments of the government didn't begin making the changes in the coat of arms and their documentation and, and various other uh, places that the coat of arms showed up until around 2000. And one of the things to understand is that these types of legal changes in the system don't just usually happen overnight. They're brought in over a period of time for many reasons, I'm sure. Now, um, the Queen's uh, official recognition of the new coat of arms was done in 1994. The House of Commons debates publishes a document after the debates with regards to a record of everything that was debated. It's the official written record of the debates and then there's also Canada Gazette where the uh, laws and other things that changes to the system are actually published and are considered official notice. Now you notice the Queen approved the new coat of arms in 94 but uh, the Commons, House of Commons debate record, the official record, did not show a change in the coat of arms on the cover of the record until 1996. And the Canada Gazette did not show a change until October of 97. So uh, you can actually find these documents online and there are images below which I've captured. I went to the library and dug up the different reports and photocopied the last uh, image which had the old coat of arms and the first image with the new coat of arms and you can uh, look at these things here the Gazette and the uh, House of Commons debates documents so they mark a point in time when the official change took place on the documentation uh, the Canadian dollar also changed the coat of arms disappeared with the gold fringe flag on it and was replaced by the new coat of arms and uh, let's see what was the date on that. Um, first appearance, uh, 2001 was the first appearance of the coat of arms with no fringes. So again, there's a whole history of when these events occurred. Now, one of the things that just caught my eye was uh, an issue with regards to the oaths that lawyers entering the bar take. And I noticed the particular date uh, of the change when the Law Society created a new, here we go, a new oath. So Barristers and Solicitors Oath. You can find this online, links will be below. Uh, Law Society, British Columbia. The current form was adopted by the benchers in April 1993 in response to a proposal to eliminate the requirement to swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen. Now I find it interesting that the Bar Association, uh, Law Society of British Columbia, the Bar, would uh, take the Queen out of their oath because we seem to believe that they're all bound to uh, her in terms of allegiance and so on. But in 1993 they took her out of their oath. They no longer required benchers to swear an oath to the Queen before they took their position within the society. Now there was uh, arguments within the House of Commons um, many many years ago where people who were elected as MPs going into the House wanted to amend the oath that they took to be an MP to add, not remove the Queen's allegiance uh, par portion of the oath, not remove that, but add uh, a notation in the oath to Canada and to the citizens of Canada, the constituents. 
but that was uh, shot down and uh, that uh, movement to bring in some recognition of the Constitution of Canada or citizens of Canada or Canada itself instead of just an allegiance to the Queen uh, has never passed and uh, MPs presently just swear allegiance to the Queen and no reference to Canada or citizens. But the barristers and solicitors though changed in 1993 where they removed any allegiance to the Queen. And I remember these dates, and I go, isn't it interesting that in 1993, they no longer were swearing allegiance to the Queen. In 1994, the Queen says we no longer require these uh, gold fringe flags uh, on the uh, coat of arms. And I believe that there's a major legal and political um, influence based on that particular change. So the barristers have changed their oath. The coat of arms changes. The coat of arms gets removed from uh, everything or changed uh, from from variety of things. And uh, this again just kind of triggered my curiosity with regards to that. And there's lots of other information about the various types of oaths that are sworn and the various uh, uh, official duties and so on that uh, are related to the various positions. So it's a good single source for all that. And the law society rules presently now has an oath of office, which is, here it is, I name, uh, let's see, I do, I do swear or solemnly affirm that I will abide by the Legal Profession Act, the Law Society Rules, and the Code of Professional Conduct, and will faithfully discharge the duties of whatever office they are according to the best of my ability, and I will uphold the objects of the Law Society and ensure that I'm guided by the public interest in the performance of my duty. Well, I'm curious, what are the objects of the Law Society? What That would be good to know. And uh, the definition of public interest is always up in the air, especially if you're a lawyer. And uh, the Law Profession Act, Law Society Rules, and Code of Professional Conduct, those are internal rules. There is no external force on the Law Society in that they are accountable to no one. It's an internally uh, organized and structured and accountable system. And uh, they're not pledging to do anything except uh, play by their own set of rules, which is always uh, kind of interesting. Now, this um, uh, there's also a books that are available online from this. This particular one, once you look at the oaths, there's actually a chicken oath. And this is an interesting little tidbit with regards to where oaths come from, how different oaths are created for different people, because the whole idea of an oath is to bind a person's conscience. So if you have them swear an oath that they don't feel bound by, uh, it's no good. So the idea of an oath is to match the oath to the conscience of the person, something that they will actually take seriously and uh, hold themselves accountable to. So that's a quick update on the oaths, and I uh, will put all these links down below so you can go and check them out yourself. But uh, I think it's very interesting that the Law Society removed any requirement to pledge allegiance to the Queen at virtually the same time that the coat of arms was being removed from the, uh, or excuse me, the fringe flags were being removed from the coat of arms of Canada. Oh, one other thing uh, attached on the end here is a video clip from a movie that was done by, by the BBC, presented on BBC, where it's about uh, the investigation into Lady Diana's death and how the manipulation of the outcome of the investigation into that, the public thinks that the responsibility was pinned on the um, paparazzi, but the actual legal conclusion was different than that made by the inquiry, and how the official inquiry has been lost in terms of its conclusions, and the media has uh, focused all the attention in the wrong place and the wrong people for the blame of that. So that's an interesting one, and uh, th there is a particular uh, portion in here with regards to um, one fellow who was made a MP and was being sworn into his office, and he makes the enlightening uh, note that when he was given the oath, he said, no, I don't agree, and they said, it's not up to you to agree, you have been administered the oath. So there is the legal assumption that once you have been uh, given given the oath, it is yours as if you had agreed to it. So I find that a very interesting level of um, legal trickery in terms of assuming consent. Despite presenting itself as a charming and picturesque relic of the past, the royal family retains a ruthless grip on power in 21st century Britain. It presides over a corrupt and corrosive honours system. 
that keeps tens of thousands of public officials in permanent obedience to the monarchy, all hoping for a knighthood or an OBE in return for a lifetime's loyal service. These are the people who operate Britain's system of government. Judges, coroners, civil servants, police chiefs, permanent private secretaries, members of the secret services and privy councillors. When I became a cabinet minister, I was made a privy councillor. You swear that you will protect the Queen from all foreign prelates, potentates and powers and you will report on colleagues if they're disloyal and so on. <clears throat> and they read it to me and I said at the end, I didn't say it, I didn't agree. And they said, you don't have to agree. So I said, what do you mean? They said, we've administered the oath. Now, that phrase, the administration of oaths, which people would have heard, means you're injected with the oath. I've been injected with an oath. The royals don't only use honours and oaths of allegiance to preserve their power. They use intimidation too, as Diana found to her cost. They demand absolute secrecy and loyalty from their subjects, and they stifle dissent. I think of the establishment, our establishment, as a kind of a, 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 a legal... Um, a legal mafia whose watchword really is the watchword of the of the, of, of the real mafia omerta silence that's why many people regard them as gangsters gangsters in tiaras and given prince philip's nazi background is it really so unthinkable that those at the top of the present day british establishment might go to any lengths to rid themselves of a turbulent princess